Ready? Just a second, Brian, if you don't mind. Okay, ready? Okay. Oh. Did you spike the cop? Yeah. Neither did tonight. Yeah, I run to get a cop. It's a little strong, guys. I knew it. Do it. There we go. Okay. Did you get it? Yep. All right. Okay. Um, I'll call the meeting back to, to um, order to reconvene again in open session. Uh, welcome everyone to this regular meeting of the Amory Board of Education. The first item on the agenda tonight are the consent agenda items. I had the uh, vouchers tonight. Everything appeared to be in order, so I will move that we approve the consent agenda items. Okay. Is second there a second? That. Is there a second? Yes, I okay. second that. All in favor say aye. 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 Anyone opposed? All right, the consent agenda items are approved. Um, the next item on the agenda are the community comments. Uh, I would like to welcome to this meeting um, of the Board of Education that we are pleased that you're interested in the school district educational issues. Your input may be very beneficial to the development of appropriate educational programs. You may address the board only during the community comments time on the agenda. Amory School District residents, district employees, and guests invited by the board may address the board at the discretion of the presiding board member. In order for the meeting to flow smoothly, we would appreciate that the following guidelines be followed by anyone wishing to address the Board of Education. For those wishing to speak before the board, a sign-up sheet will be available to, prior to the start of the meeting. If the topic noted on the sign-up sheet is deemed to be out of order, the presiding board member will inform the person wishing to speak prior to the start of the meeting. Comment time is limited to five minutes per person. However, the time may, limit may be increased or decreased at any time by the presiding board member. The time allocated for community comments may also be ended at the determination of the presiding board member. Comments and suggestions related to the school district operation are welcome. Personnel criticism of members of the Board of Education or employees of the Amory School District is out of order. Please stand to be recognized when your name is called and after being recognized come to the podium and give your name and address for the record. The Board normally receives citizen input and does not respond or debate. If there is a need for an answer or response to a concern or an issue, the district administrator or one of the other administrators may get back to you within a week. If your concern requires board action, it may be placed on the agenda of some future board meeting. The first person wishing to speak before the board today is Stephanie Jansen. Can I take this down? Do I need my address? Yes. 645 140th Street, Amory. I have spent the last week reaching out and talking to parents of the community, some who have joined us here today. I have listened as parents shared the unique struggles their families have faced around these forced mandates. The loss of interaction with absence of parent volunteering, how children are struggling academically the lack of logic behind quarantines, the struggling of multiple quarantines, the daily pleas to attend school without a mask, the constant mask reprimands that place pressure between peers and staff and the bullying and shaming that now has taken place. Back in the fall, the district conducted a parent survey and of those participated, of over 70% stated they wanted masks to be a choice, not a mandate. As the district pulled the rug out from under our feet and the board voted against parents' wishes, many were optimistic that these mandates would be short-lived and possibly just the efforts that would soon return our life back to normal. But here we are today, nearly nine months later, and there's absolutely no conversation happening around reevaluating the mandates in place. Parents and students have no idea what the future looks like. Will students be wearing masks for summer school? How about the student band trip to Florida? One parent raised concern after being told that they will be expected to follow the district's policy 
and represent the school district of Amory regardless of the, mass, the mandates in Florida. I have a child who will be attending 4K in the fall, or should be. Will I be able to walk her down the hallway, visit her classroom, or will, I experience, or will our experiences be limited to picking her up from school like she's a Happy Meal? May is Mental Health Awareness Month, and the Amory High School Student Council is working to raise awareness and end the stigma around mental health. Mental health has been near and dear to my heart for many reasons. I guess that's to be expected when you've lost a loved one to suicide or know a child who suffers so deeply that they want their life to end. One in six youth are silently suffering from mental health. I'm interested to know the district's position on supporting mental health and what kind of actions the student council plans to take. Over the past year, Americans have been profoundly affected by the changes surrounding COVID-19. In fact, some experts believe we are facing a national mental health crisis that could yield serious health effects for years to come, particularly to our youth. Over the past months, parents have stood afar and listened to the types of bullying and name calling that their children have rendered. Our kids are coming home with bits of stories that we've tried to piece together to get a clear picture of what's really happening since we've been removed. For instance, a student shared at the high school that a high school teacher who was pregnant told another student to pull up his gator mask because he would kill her baby. A two-point disciplinary system that's being implemented where if high school students are caught once with the mask down, they're warned. Twice, their phones are taken away. Last week at the high school, a message was shared that the mask mandate will not be lifted this school year, placing a lot of empathy towards those who may not attend events like prom, sports, graduation, if the mandate was lifted. How might these messages and interactions come across to those struggling with changes surrounding COVID-19, who feel depressed, invalid, belittled, unworthy, insecure, or even attacked? I'm absolutely heartbroken to even think that this type of dialogue would take place in our schools. It's shameful, bullying and manipulation, which are all forms of abuse that wear down and eat away at the mental health of our youth. I've asked it once and I'll ask it again. Are we making education, educated and rational decisions surrounding the mandates enforced at our schools? Or are the decisions being implemented falling along political lines? I recently received a medical exemption form and was surprised to discover, and I quote, please note, the following conditions are not considered reasons for exemption to the face covering policy. Asthma and other pulmonary lung diseases, diabetes, kidney disorder, migraines, seizure disorder, ADHD, headache, and anxiety. These are all reasons why I would want my child to have the choice to wear a face covering. How can you determine or tell an individual who has any of these conditions that their suffering isn't enough or to be excused from wearing a face covering? How does that support the individual's mental or physical health? When I reached out to local, a local health provider I was informed that they wouldn't be able to sign this form, that it doesn't support an exemption for mental health. In fact, it's discrimination. This is coming from professionals who deal with these forms every single day. Per the district's policy on face coverings, and I quote, for medical exemption requests, the district will work with local health care providers to determine which students and staff are exempt from this policy. Local health care providers will verify the existence of a medical condition and the district will make the final decision on student and staff exemptions from this policy. I'm not sure who in this district 
thinks they have the authority to override a treatment plan that's signed by a medical professional. The fact that the district is making it so difficult to get an exemption goes to show they knew what they were doing was wrong when they dismissed the results of the parent survey last fall. Parents like myself are done setting fire to our children so that the rest can stay comfortable. When it comes to taking care of my family, I am the expert. The bullying and name calling at the middle school is apparently the worst we've ever seen. Why won't the district acknowledge that the restrictions placed over our school and the bullying that surrounds it might have an impact on behavior today? And will you continue to let pride stand in the way or maybe find a more neutral ground for our students to coexist? Thank you. Thank you for those comments. Uh, the next person wishing to speak is uh, Julie Bearcant. <clears throat> Julie Bearcant, 514 Little Falls Drive, Amory. Good evening. I, uh, I have two children who attend the school district, and um, I'm also asking to re uh, to reevaluate the mask policy. The board members board powers responsibilities. Number one says to make sure students educational development is a central concern of board policies and the district administrators rule. And number three is to adopt effective policies after discussing problems and issues with the district administrator and hearing from staff and citizen committees. I take that to be that since the committees when we had the parent survey back last summer were 21.9 percent of the parents on the multiple choice question of I would feel safer for my children to attend school if only 21.9% of parents wanted their students to wear masks. 78.1% said no. The staff survey said 36.3% of them wanted the students in masks. To me, I take that as the um, uh, survey said no to making masks mandatory. The first communication on July 14th said face masks will be required of all staff members and recommended were able for all students. That drastically changed on July 21st when there was a huge amount of calling, emailing up from the community about the safety of its staff and students. So the new bounce back plan was as follows. The staff will require to wear masks, all students require in school transportation, all students K through five will be wearing masks outside the primary classrooms, and all students in the middle and high school require to wear masks throughout the day. Unbeknownst to us, on August 20th, the face covering policy was put into place with no communication to us. The comment of when required by county or state order as directed by the district administration and or the board of education. No communication was made um, along with no timeline as to when <coughs> that mandate would be uh, reevaluated re -evaluated and lifted. The first said was based on the governor's mandate that has since lifted. When asked several times, the, f the, the response was the CDC, the Department of Public Health, and Amory Hospitals say that this is what is best, the wearing of masks. If we are going by the status that this is for medical purposes, I have masks that says non-medical. I have a mask that I was sent my kids to school also says non-medical, pleated mask. So if this is for medical purposes, why are we allowing making our children and staff wear stuff that specifically says non-medical? It's time to stop living in fear. God gives us free will. We take into account the data we have before us and we go with our, with our best decision. Doctors can recommend procedures, but they can also, they can't make you do them. You are, have now given yourselves more power than a doctor that we have to do with them. And let me be clear, I'm not saying we have to have them removed and nobody can wear them. It is free will. People should have the choice to choose if they so want to wear them. A mask is a PPE, a personal protective equipment, which means that you wear it for you. You don't wear it for somebody else. I do not wear a uh, seat belt in my car to prevent you dying in a car accident. That's for, protect, for protecting me. 
And I'd like to remind people that there was a law passed last May, uh, March, where the school cannot be held liable for anyone contracting or dying from COVID while in their uh, um, proximity of their building. So if people are concerned about lawsuits happening, that cannot be done. All I'm asking is to please take a look. We have spoken up, and if people want to do another survey and see if the community has changed its stance on how we feel about face masking, we're more than happy to do so. Thank you. Uh, thanks for those comments. The next person um, signed up to speak is uh, Joseph Vierkant. Hello, I'm Joseph Vierkant, 514 Little Falls Drive, Amory. I also kind of want to discuss some other things that I've seen that I would like to address. And I know, uh, I guess, the discussion is about obviously the mask policy that you have. Um, but some of the things that I find are disappointing. And, and it's really taking effect on parents. And it goes down to leadership. It goes down to transparency, communication, and the inability to bridge a gap of information between parents and this board are, is really saddening to me. And I feel it speaks volumes, as two of the previous speakers just brought up when we addressed the community with that last survey. And when you have parents who feel that their voice isn't being heard and they're being oppressed, I think we have issues. In some ways, I think it comes across more like a dictatorship rather than a democracy. Meetings, emails, and surveys, and communication is key. We need to address the goals. We need to communicate those goals to our parents. And I hope it's our attempt to find that homeostasis and to get things back. But if we don't start moving things back, even at some form of pace, the pendulum is going to swing and people will not respect or trust you. The mask mandate was repealed. I happen to be a person who believes in law. I've served this country for over 20 years. And saddening like defense attorneys, you've circumvented law by creating policy. Do we really want a more restrictive government? And lastly, is for any parent, anyone who wants to make a difference, The best way to solve this, if our voices are not being heard, is to replace one of these people. And I only saw two people's names on the last election. I guess I didn't know about it. Sorry, I didn't know it would be in by January. But I know that there are good people who are willing to dedicate the time, work ethic, to be here. So if you don't, if you feel like you're not being heard, Replace these people. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, the next person on the list is uh, Kelsey Omen. And her friends. <laughs> Good evening, everyone. My name is Kelsey Oman, and I am currently a senior at Amory High School. I am here tonight to say a huge thank you to the Amory High School staff and administration. As we all know, the Wisconsin Supreme Court recently lifted the statewide mask mandate. Hearing this news was relieving and unsettling for me at the same time. A sigh of relief for myself because it gives me hope that we are nearing normal life once again. 
However, it was a little bit unnerving because the next six weeks are filled with things that I so desperately long for as a high school student. A little bit over a year ago, my friends and I had picked out our junior prom dresses and had begun making plans for a fun day with our dates. On a day like any other, we were told that we would be out of school for the following two weeks, and as everyone knows, we didn't set foot into a school building until the first day of our senior year this past fall. Last spring was full of letdowns for my classmates and I. No junior prom, no spring sports season, no last day of school craziness, no goodbyes to the class of 2020. This year, however, has been more than I ever could have expected. Adjustments have been made, but regardless of that, events have still gone on. Homecoming was so much fun. A week filled with dress-up days, powder puff football, field games, royalty crowning, and of course, a football game. Amory won, by the way, and that was the best way to end a senior season for our lucky football guys. Snow week this winter was successful as well, yet another week full of fun activities and excitement. All of this has been able to happen this year because we have been fortunate enough to have staff members that have been advocating for their students all year long. The Amory High School staff has made all of these events possible. Our teachers have been given an extremely difficult task this year. They have not only been teachers, but also personal mentors, child advocates, sanitization specialists, COVID contact tracers, and social distancing experts. And all of this is on top of grading papers, building student-teacher relationships, and making it to every required meeting on time and prepared. I can't imagine doing what all of you do, and I also don't have the words to even begin to express my appreciation for all of you. In the coming weeks, prom will be coming to Amory High School, and all four of us girls, at least, are super excited. Although it looks different, I am determined to make it as fun as possible. Following prom is our spring concert for chamber, jazz, and concert choir, as well as jazz and concert band. Us band and choir kids haven't had the chance to perform in nearly a year and a half, so this is super exciting. Once concert season has wrapped up, the class of 2021 will finally get to walk across the stage and receive our diplomas. This is so hard to believe, as I feel like I hardly even wrapped up my junior year after such an odd ending. Graduation is so important to me and my classmates, and our hearts would be absolutely broken if it were to be canceled or if any one of us were unable to attend due to anything COVID-related. All throughout this past year, the words, I love wearing a mask, have never come out of anyone's mouth, at least not that I'm aware of. It's not that fun, but it's not permanent. Life will return to normal someday, but we aren't there yet. I'm respectfully asking for everyone to continue wearing a face covering for the next six <coughs> weeks, for the sake of the class of 2021 especially. We've done it for this long, so what's another 30 days at school? I am hopeful that after this school year wraps up, mask will potentially be a thing of the past. Thank you so much to everyone for your cooperation so, mar so far and for allowing myself and my classmates to enjoy an absolutely unpredictable senior year. Lastly, thank you endlessly to the Amory High School staff for doing everything in their power to allow us to have an exciting, fun, and safe school year. Uh, Jenna Hendrickson. Um, hello, my name is Jenna Hendrickson and I'm also an Amory High School senior. Uh, first, I would also like to thank the board and administration for everything you've done in the past year to get us where we are today. Yes, we've clearly lost a lot in the last year due to the pandemic and I won't even begin to list the high school events, trips, opportunities that we will never get back. It hasn't been easy, but we are moving forward and we have been moving forward all school year. Because of the safety guidelines, we've been in school, in person, for almost the entire school year. We see our teachers face to face. Yes, we are in masks, but we can talk in person, have labs together, we can work together in small groups, sing, we can play in the band, we can work out in Phi Ed class and after school, and we can be with one another. We had a fall and winter sports season, and a spring season begins next week. And most importantly, we are headed into six weeks of events to include performing live music for our parents for the first time in over a year, prom, senior awards night, our senior walk, and graduation. I believe that we are where we are today because we followed the safety guidelines and measures to the best of our ability. It hasn't been perfect, but it's been working. No one likes wearing a mask, but science proves that they help, and if wearing a mask in school will increase the chances of the upcoming in-person concerts and other senior events, including graduation, then we need to continue doing what we're doing for just a little while longer. 
Let's continue moving forward rather than increasing the chances of potentially taking steps backwards with, adi with additional student quarantines and canceled events. Thank you. Thank you. It's, it's so nice to hear from students and I would encourage more students who actually have to live this with this man mask mandate on a daily basis in school every day to um, to come forward and, and speak more often regarding this controversial issue. Um, so anyway, that's it for community comments. Um, the next would be, did you, were you gonna? I'll say it after All right, the next um, item on the agenda um, are the administrative reports. Okay, on the um, screen you will see, you're after me, Mr. Gold, so not quite yet. <laughs> <laughs> I appreciate your eagerness to speak, but on the screen you'll see the learning model transition plan. This is what we adopted oh so long ago and we've been following ever since. I'm not going to belabor the point. You've seen the colors. You know the drill in regards to the matrix. The second slide, and I only have a total of five slides, are the numbers over the course of the days in this window, trailing back to March 31st up through today. Uh, with tomorrow being the last day in this window. The blue marks the county, the red marks the district. We're at 99 and 7, respectively. The third slide are positive cases in district traced back to September 1st, the first day of school through today. And you'll see the breakdown by clubhouse, elementary, intermediate, middle, high school, then other. The other category could be district office, bus transportation, or anything else. Uh, it's simply not building specific. And you'll see the total number of cases that existed where it's an intermediate middle school situation of 0.5, that's a person that's split between those two buildings. It's not half of a person. Uh, you'll see the percentage of staff that's been affected at 15.5 and you'll see the percentage of students at 7.4. That's the percentage who have tested positive. The next slide is a breakdown within CESA 11. Uh, survey, this would be about 10 days or so ago now by Executive Director Jerry Walters of CESA 11. There are 39 schools in CESA 11, which for those who don't speak the nomenclature that is schools, the schools that make up Northwest Wisconsin is, is the better way to describe it. Of those on that survey, of those schools, five have indicated that they are doing away with their mandate, some immediately, some as of May 1st, and then 34 are still in place. That's not to say that there isn't change that happens here in April and May. I'm simply saying to you what the survey said at the time it was given within the last seven or 10 days. There's one more slide and that relates to winter at, uh, spring athletics and I'm gonna cover that in just a moment. But right now I'd like to read a statement if you could please. If you could put that up on the screen, Becky, thank you. Statement reads as follows. The school district of Amory policy requiring face coverings, i.e. face masks, will remain in place through Friday, June 4th, 2021. All students, staff members, and visitors, including parents and guardians, will continue to be required to wear face coverings while on school grounds, on school transportation, and at school events when required by a county or a state order or as directed by district administration and or the Board of Education. The reasons for the continuance of this policy, first, since March of 2020, the school district of Amory has followed COVID-19 recommendations provided by Polk County Health Department, the Wisconsin Department of Health Services, and the Centers for Disease Control. Each of these agencies deem masks to be essential towards continuing in-person instruction. Second, we are interested in keeping all students eligible for spring events. Without a mask requirement, we will likely increase the number of COVID cases in district and thereby increase the number of students in quarantine. Kids who are in quarantine are not eligible to participate in spring events, including prom, graduation, concerts, and athletics. Third, our staff, our kids, their families, and the community are not nearly fully vaccinated. 
If these groups are not further along in their vaccination, there is an increased chance of COVID spread. There is an increased chance that our schools will not remain in face-to-face -face instructional model unless more individuals in these groups are vaccinated. We want our kids to remain in school the remainder of the school year. The next big event on the docket is spring sports. If you could go back to that slide, please. The Middle Border Conference Athletic Directors met last Wednesday. And the <coughs> summary of this conversation very much mirrors what's happening at WIAA. And what I mean by that is the guidance you see here is the protocol that will exist at regionals, sectionals, and state. So I'm going to run through the four bullet points that you see here. At competitions, athletes are required to wear a mask at all times except <coughs> during warm-ups and during times they are directly participating in an event or a game. That is a departure from what we did in the winter where people were masked up during competition. Coaches will be masked up at all times at competitions. Masks are not required at practice for coaches and athletes. Coaches are asked to mask up if they cannot socially distance at practice. And lastly, spectators are encouraged to wear a mask if they cannot socially distance. We are outside for the entirety of the spring sports season in that those events are all outdoor events. The next item on the docket after spring sports is summer school. We are meeting on summer school on April 27th. The summer school director, Mrs. Laura Shulgren, and the administrative team to make determinations about what we're going to do in summer school. No decisions have been made about mass or really much of anything in the mitigation efforts yet. April 27th is when that conversation will occur. What's going to be the offshoot of that conversation? I couldn't begin to tell you. We haven't had it yet. The next big event after summer school, obviously, is the start of school year 21-22. We have not had a conversation about whether we're wearing masks in September. We're five months away from that. We couldn't begin to know what's going to be happening then. The first meeting about fall takes place at our first administrative team meeting on Tuesday, June 8th. So we'll have that conversation then. We meet again in July. We meet another time in July. Then we meet in August. All of those meetings, I imagine, will surround some of the mitigation efforts that exist in the fall, including whether or not we're looking at masks. I don't have a decision for summer school. I don't have a decision for the fall. None of us do. It hasn't happened yet. Last thing I'd like to say, we met with the music department after school today, the administrative team and the four members of the music department. We are looking at reopening the world of music in the school district of Amory. It's very important to our kids. It's very important to our parents and their families. It's also very important to our staff. We are starting to do face-to-face -face concerts in the school district of Amory. It's going to be happening here in the month of April and the month of May. The kids that were here a few minutes ago foreshadowed that. That's very important to everybody. It looks very different than what we had last April, where we weren't even here. So that's a hopeful part of our spring. We don't want anyone to miss any events because we've got a lot of cool events lined up. So that's the entirety of the narrative that I have. If any of the board members had anything to say, this would certainly be the time to do that. No. Um. <clears throat> you do have something to say and um <coughs> i feel that as an elected official at this you're going to need to get closer to the mic i think sure thanks <clears throat> i feel like as an elected official of the school um it's important to address emails that come to us with concerns it's important to address community members and their concerns and um instead of doing that in an individual email by email basis or an individual phone call basis. For me, I would just like to address those here. Um, as long as I've been a member of this board for three years, I don't know of anybody that has any nefarious political agenda. Um, I feel that the heart of this board 
and I can speak personally for myself, is that we want to do what's best for our students, our staff, and our community. <clears throat> Forgive me, this is probably the hardest thing I've had to say at a board meeting, only because I take it so personally, um, and my heart, my heart is really in this job, um, and to listen to comments that this board um, has some agenda to run. It's hard to listen to. Um, we've heard about mental health and how important it is. And I look at the districts. I've talked to many people from the districts where they don't have masks right now. And there is more increased bullying from kids who are wearing masks, kids who aren't wearing masks. It goes in both directions. I certainly don't want to add to that kind of culture here. I can only imagine what we see in our schools is a microcosm of what happens in our communities. I've read the comments on Facebook. I have not commented on the comments that I've seen on Facebook from adults. And if our adults are behaving this way on Facebook, I understand why kids are acting that way to each other. I want to choose to not be part of that culture. I want to choose to be able to have differences of opinion and be respectful in those differences of opinion. We've worked hard to open our schools. We went from not having school at all from March of last year until the end. I'll never forget walking in the hall in April to come in for a, a board meeting or a, something I had to do at school and everything looked like it was a Friday that like kids were just, the halls were just waiting for kids to come back and I cried knowing that I didn't think that the kids were gonna come back. I think if everybody knew how many sleepless nights the board has probably had, um, how many tears I've cried, um, how many times that I've had conversations um, with members of our district on how to open schools. Maybe the comments won't be so flippant. We've compromised by changing the learning model to get kids into school. We know that the most important thing is to have face-to-face -face education I think the parents know that the, the most important thing is for kids to be here. And sometimes we have to make sacrifices that we don't feel comfortable with in order for the greater good. We've allowed sports, we've allowed activities to go on. Things are happening in the spring that we didn't think were going to ever happen. My son was a class of 2020. They didn't get graduation until August. They didn't get to walk down the halls and see all the kids. Sometimes I think those kids would have given anything to have these compromises be made so that they could have those opportunities back. Our mask policy was written with the intent of being fluid as the cases and protocols changed, not as the political mandates changed. We're trying. The mask mandate was just lifted a week ago. I ask that you just grant us some grace to have those conversations. This board cannot have conversations outside this room. Those are open meeting violations. We can't talk about things until they are on a meeting. Either we have to call for a special meeting or we do it here. As I understand, we'll be revisiting the policy again in May. The district provided alternatives for parents that felt strongly either way about masks or health safety concerns. The options have been taking a toll on our staff as well. It's not fun for all of our staff to have to police the masks and the kids and the reminders. It's not fun for our staff to have to teach their classroom and teach kids virtually and keep track of it all. It's been taxing on them too. When we talk about mental health, the mental health of our staff has suffered too. I don't want to add to a continuing climate where everything just seems to deteriorate. 
we have so many bigger things to worry about. We're trying to focus on the mental health and focusing on this mask policy and dealing with all of that stuff right now on an individual basis takes away all of those efforts. I hope that everybody can just have some patience and work with us and see that we've been transparent and we continue to be transparent and we will try to get there. Thank you, Char. Um, we, we are going to go a little out of order here um, instead of Mr. Gould being up next. Um, I see that um, J.A. Counter is here, and I believe um, we will go right to the, act, the first action item, which is the staff insurance renewal, um, prior to going through the rest of the administrative report so she can get out of here and get back home. Good evening. Can you guys hear me okay? Yeah. I think so. Yeah. This uh, talking with a mask is a little bit different. Yeah. <laughs> I, if, you're, if you're six feet apart. You sure, yeah, exactly, out, so, exactly. Yeah. Okay. Uh, well, thank you for allowing me to come here tonight and give you a little, little bit of an update on what we've been working on for the uh, benefits mm -hmm. for the district. Uh, 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 do I click or are you clicking, Becky? Okay, all right, thank you. So again, my name is Linda Skoglen. We're here to just kind of give you a recap of what we've seen, what we've been doing, and what we're recommending for the 2021-2022 uh, plan year. So first of all, just a really quick benefit overview. The district provides employees with a, what we call a high deductible health plan that works in conjunction with a health savings account. Employees have a health plan that's got a $2,800 deductible for single coverage and $5,400 for family. But the district also makes a contribution to an HSA account to help folks meet that deductible of $1,200 for single and $2,400 for family. Premium contributions for the plan are 88% of the plan premiums for full-time staff. And we do have a wellness program that we've had for the last couple of years that's been really well received. Um, and there's a deductible differentiate, uh, 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 I'm sorry, a differential in the deductible of $500 per single and 1,000 for family coverage for those who um, participate versus not participate in the wellness program. So it's a great benefit. Um, when it comes to the rate adjustments for the 2021-2022 plan year, the district is in the last year of a two-year rate guarantee with health partners in which uh, you were guaranteed a, a not to exceed 9%. Health partners came in the way the rate calculated this year. Health partners came in with a 3.84% renewal. So happy to say that came in well under the 9% cap. Along with that, we asked health partners if they would agree to a reduction in that number if we were to extend our rate agreement a second year. It, again, having a 9% rate cap in that second year. Um, and they, they agreed to do so. They were dropping the rates 2% uh, in, in by um, extending that rate cap out another year. So the savings to the district would be about $59,000, leaving a net increase to the district with a 1.84% increase of $54,744. When you look at the rate history and what we've seen in our partnership with health partners, we've been able to negotiate second year rate caps uh, for several years in a row now. And you can see the cost of the district over a period of time and the average rate increase. When I average that rate increase over this period of time, you've averaged about a 4.25% rate increase over that period of time, which is actually quite a bit less than what we uh, would typically see for infl uh, inflation, medical inflation, which is running closer to seven to 9%. So what we're recommending for the 2021-2022 plan year is to take the extended guarantee, dropping that rate increase down to 1.84%, realizing the savings of $59,000, and then extending that rate cap out yet another year. Uh, continue to pay the 88% of the premium and have the um, 
district contributing to the HSA for the same amount as they have been. So overall impact to the district would be a premium spend increase of just over $54,000. HSA contributions would remain unchanged just based on your enrollment counts. Employee impact over a 12 month period of time would be about 20, just under 22 bucks for single coverage and just under 50 bucks for family. As far as a health and well being program, uh, we also recommend that you continue with the Health Partners Health and Well Being. We've seen some really good momentum. We've got 83.5% of the population is participating in the Health and Welfare Program. Um, it's been very well received. Uh, so during, and, and basically we're gonna ask for the same, the same requirements this year that we did last year where employees and spouses on the health plan would be invited to complete a confidential health assessment program to, to <coughs> earn this preferred deductible. On the dental program, uh, the district, again, the district contribution on the dental is 88% of the premium. Health Partners is offering a 0% renewal, so no rate change. That would be a rate pass for this year. So I'd recommend renewing with Health Partners as well. Your vision, um, we had, when we implemented the vision, we negotiated a multi-year rate guarantee. Um, and actually last year Delta Dental extended that so there's no rate increase this year. Those rates are locked in until June of 2023. Disability plan, there's no rate change for the disability. Your basic life insurance did see a small increase at 9.5% but total impact to the district is about $1,800. Uh, but no change to any of the voluntary life rates. And then no change to the rates for the critical illness and accident program that's available through UNM. So just recommending a renew as is with those. Can I answer any questions? <clears throat> you had mentioned the wellness program is like uh, 80, 83 and a half percent participation. Yeah. Um, is that with our plan here at school or is that at health partners in general? That's your plan here at school. Okay. And is that pretty comparable? higher or lower to higher say, higher than a, a health partners average yeah okay yeah so we're really pleased with that okay great mm -hmm. other questions i don't think so any other discussion no. or um, questions <coughs> all right i'll make a motion that we um renew the uh the health agreement with um, JA Counter and uh, Health Partners for another year. Okay, second. Okay, <laughs> all in favor say aye. 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 Anyone opposed? Aye. All right, the renewal is approved. Thank you very much. Thank you, Thank you for the opportunity to be here tonight. Thank you, Linda. Thank you, Linda. All right, uh, back to administrative reports now. Now you're up, Josh. <laughs> <laughs> no, wait, wait, Josh. He's getting his steps in for his, his the health differential. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Not gonna lie, I didn't get a lot of steps in today. <laughs> well, uh, it, it has been a, a really busy month at AHS and excited and, and proud to say that all at the same time. And if uh, you're looking for something to do between now and, and June 5th, I think we have uh, one or two nights in the remaining schedule where there won't be an activity going on somewhere, someplace, somehow due to the way that they scheduled that alternate spring sports season. Lots to see and do over the next six weeks. So that's great. Um, first off, as you can anticipate, um, with uh, all the retirements at the high school, we have been extremely busy hiring staff here the last month uh, and hopefully soon to have that all finished up. Uh, we did get our ACT results in uh, for our students and we actually got it uh, an admin report late last week. Um, our results came in about where they were project projected based on their freshman ACT Aspire scores. As you realize, they didn't take the Aspire as a sophomore, so the only comparable data we had was their ninth grade test, and they came in with, within uh, two percentage, uh, two tenths of a point to where they were projected, so we were okay with that. Um, we took the forward test this past Friday. Uh, it's a two-part social studies test. It'll be a while till we get the results in, but early returns say that uh, the kids did a good job. I already mentioned the spring sports have been starting up. Um, this weekend we had 
uh, the great privilege of watching some of our uh, amazingly talented students perform in the, the school play uh, clue. They put together a great performance, uh, three nights with limited audiences available, but they did a great job. Um, and uh, very proud of those kids. They've been putting a lot of time and effort in basically since after Christmas break. So kudos to not just the kids that were involved in the actual play itself, but lighting crews and background crews and people that worked on the, the staging. There's so many people that go into it than just the eight, nine kids that you see up on stage. And uh, Mrs. Erdrich, uh, the director and, and, and her crew, they did just a wonderful job. There is um, another weekend of showings next weekend on the 16th, 17th, and 18th. Um, and there are some tickets available. I would highly encourage you if you can get down and, and watch it, it was, it's worth it, it really is. Um, our master schedule for 21-22 is nearly constructed. We're really excited with how that's shaking out. We have our 9th and 10th grade ACT Aspire test coming up on Thursday, April 22nd. So that's another big day um, where we won't have juniors and seniors in the building and 9th and 10th graders will be doing their state testing. Uh, April 24th, huge night, I don't know if the girls are still here, but prom on April 24th. Um, we're very excited for that. We have our Fine Arts Night on May 5th and the chance to hear our kids uh, sing and play their instruments. We're really excited for that. And then of course, graduation coming up on Sunday, May 23rd. And um, always, you know, plans are always in the works, but um, you know, we'll be patient and we can always hope to improve things and improve things. And um, we're just really excited that we're getting to do so many events. So thank you very much for allowing that to happen. I just wanted to give a little shout out to the uh, production because um I'm on social media, obviously, more than I should be. But this is one of the good things that I heard. Like, everybody just rave reviews of, of the play. And I, didn't, I couldn't make it um, because of the farm. But it was, um, I heard a lot of really good things. And it's just another really positive thing that our school district is doing. It was fantastic. Yes, I loved it. It was. My kids want to go again. Yeah. <laughs> this weekend. I may have gone three yes. times. But, yeah. And Mrs. White was especially good. Yeah, that was awesome. Any other questions? Tom, I'm sorry if I went into your time frame there. <laughs> Thanks, Mr. Gold. I just guess I want to start by um, thanking the board for the support that you've shown from I represent the middle school, obviously, but uh, I don't think we would be face-to-face -face into the point we are if you hadn't shown good leadership, and I appreciate everything, and I know my, our staff and all buildings do as well. Um, we started middle school track, and that's been really cool, and uh, our first meet is this coming Thursday, so we're excited for that. Um, middle school track is an exposure time where kids are trying out uh, lots of different types of events and, and get, getting used to that sport. It's new to them, to a lot of them. So we're really excited to see that start. And um, we have a couple meets next week. Our, I think uh, next Thursday, our home meet will be in Amory. Today we had eighth grade human growth and development day. And I want to thank um, Debbie Lecision from Polk County Health who came in. And then Dr. Gary Williamson, who was willing to and, and enjoys coming to Amory to speak so much that he drives it once a year from Appleton to do this presentation. And he did a really nice job, and we were very excited for that. Um, as you know, that's, a, that's a, a presentation that was planned and kind of uh, directed from our Human Growth and Development Committee, which represents uh, school board members, principals, teachers, parents, um, clergy members, and medical providers that help kind of plan and guide where we go with those types of um, programs. Uh, Ford State Test is com complete at the middle school except for makeups. Uh, we started a little bit earlier than some of the others and um, I probably have about seven or eight kids yet that uh, I haven't even gotten back yet that hopefully we will get and move forward. But I wanna thank all the teachers. They've done a great job with that administration. Uh, we do have our fine arts show coming up on April 22nd and it will be um, a live face-to-face uh, -face or you know for parents to come in limited seating for parents it's also going to be live streamed and then recorded as well for playback and so we're doing it in the middle school gym for more space we always have hold, held our spring concert there because we also put out an art show and the this year the concert will have uh, the choirs go first and then 
parents would come in that want to watch the choir and then they'll break transition and then the band um, so that we would be able to have enough seating for everybody. Uh, we also have our spring fling event. It's our 22nd annual spring fling event. Um, the kids are really, really enjoy this. It's kind of like a fun week. And so we'll be doing a lot of fun outdoor activities during that time. We're in the middle of transitioning over to uh, a new screener and progress monitoring tool for meeting and re reading and math. And uh, every building has a different leader that's kind of leading them forward. And at the middle school, I want to thank Jess Smith, who um, will be leading our staff onto some staff training about it tomorrow. And that will be a really good program. It's going to be a really, really nice addition to the district. Very seldom do you see uh, a program that is much more effective, um, easier to use, and, and less expensive. So it was a win across the board for the district. Um, we're busy right now with our English reading language arts adoption for the curriculum. It's their year in the cycle for um, grades 6 through 12. And we're meeting tomorrow to take a look at the direction from each building and, and, the, and the teachers and what they're planning to do for curriculum purchasing. They've kind of already met and all, all the different vendors and looked at the curriculum. Then they present it to their building principal. Uh, and then it goes to the school uh, administrative team. And then it goes to a curriculum oversight committee. And then once it gets there, then it will come to you. So we're kind of in the middle of that process. and I. I believe the curriculum oversight committee is later in April here. Um, lastly, um, I'm kind of excited. We do have an eighth grade speaker coming in. Um, we haven't had a lot of speakers because of COVID. And um, we had a speaker that we had for 20, probably 25 years. He was here before I came. I think I've told you about him. I was here telling you that I was so excited that we would have our Holocaust speaker come in. And um, when I was speaking to you, like he, he passed away two or three days after I spoke to you that he was coming. And so we had to cancel that event, and obviously. And uh, we've been planning and trying to work on how we, what kind of replacement we could. And we're very excited to bring in um, a guest speaker. His name is Peter Von Denka. He comes from Washington, but he's, we're lucky he's speaking in the Twin Cities. And so he's going to be coming here on April 28th. Um, he was born in um, communist Czechoslovakia. And, um, grew up in, a, in an oppressed situation and it talks about how later he's a an old elder older gentleman but he talked about how he escaped Czechoslovakia with his family and the risk that he took for freedom and what he doesn't he doesn't take it lightly and um, it's, it's a little bit to talk about some hardships that he had to make and um, things that struggles that he's had and how he overcame adversity and became a better person and it's a, a program for the eighth grade only um, I think the, to the topics are a little sensitive so we want to make sure it's, it's for eighth grade students um, we're excited to replace that, and that will also be here in April. So a lot of things going on. Any questions? Thanks. <clears throat> okay. Well, first of all, I'm going to say Tom stole my thunder. Uh, I was going to talk to you a little bit about um, curriculum, but he's right. The 6th through 12th grade have been working very, very hard this year on selecting on um, new instructional materials and we will be bringing that to you next month for your approval already starting way last fall um, the the intermediate and elementary um, our adoption is up for next year but it's such an important adoption that we really wanted to spend two full years um, researching which we have been we've just completed or will complete one year Teresa Stanley from CESA 11 came out and worked with the intermediate staff last Thursday and then worked with the Leon staff today. And um, it's just really helping us to look at our current strengths and weaknesses and um, to work on a, a developing criteria for a new adoption to make sure that we have everything we need for our kids. Uh, tonight, the, on the air, will be our virtual fourth grade concert. Uh, Mrs. Moskal and Ms. Bartell did a fabulous job putting it together. And so that will air on Facebook tonight. So make sure you try to catch some of that. We started our forward exam today uh, at the intermediate. All three grades do the forward exam. 
third and fourth graders started today, and then fifth graders will join us tomorrow. So it's a busy place when 300 kids are all taking the test at one time. Um, we have some plans for exciting things coming up this spring. We're doing um, some field trips that involve outside um, activities and will be instructed by our staff only. So we're looking at having our Warrior Walkathon. Our fourth graders will go to Interstate Park and our fifth graders will go out to Camp Wapo. We won't be staying overnight, but we'll still, still get to get out um, to camp and have some of the same activities um, that we have had in the past. And we're just so happy to be able to expand on those opportunities. Any questions? Thank you. Okay, I'm going to expand a little bit on what Orly shared with the ELA adoption because, as she said, it is such a major adoption for the primary and intermediate school. Um, Teresa Stanley, as she had mentioned, is from CESA 11 and is, is guiding us through this whole process. Both buildings have a leadership team, and last week the leadership team met with the intermediate school. Teresa met with the intermediate school leadership team. Today, she met with the elementary leadership team. We have done so much work, and the, and the teachers need to com be commended for um, the directions that they have taken from us and then fulfilling what we have asked them to do. We have a mission statement, a vision statement, and belief statements. We have identified our essential standards, which I, which I have shared with you in the past. Um, we have reviewed our data that um, we have, especially this year's data, to identify the weaknesses in our current program. And we have created this in and out document, which basically is a document that says, okay, going out of first grade, this is what we want our first graders to have in place. And coming into second grade, these, this is what we want our second graders um, to have in place. And that went from 4K all the way to grade five. Teresa Stanley is such a gift to our district, um, and I'm, I'm thankful to Dr. Durfler for helping us, um, for helping us pay for her to come to our district and work with us, because she is so extremely knowledgeable and is just guiding us um, so well in this important adoption. Um, she'll be working with us again in June, and then we hope for her to work with us at the early part of next year before we start actually piloting programs. So I'm very um, excited and very thankful for the support that um, I feel from the district and from her guidance. Um, just some dates to keep in mind. Our 4K registration is open. At this time, we have 40 4K, 40 4K children for next year already registered. That's pretty good considering our 4K population this year is 74. So we feel really good about that number. Um, we are accepting registrations for all program options that closes on Monday, April 19th. So that is basically for our legacy, lower elementary Montessori, children's house Montessori, and our project-based learning programs. Again, those option forms are due Monday. And then we will begin um, the process of um, class placements. We want to congratulate our, our elementary children for their accomplishment in our March Madness Challenge, which was to get book reviews around our entire school. The, the children did um, meet that challenge. So um, our big celebration was to play celebration from Cool and the Gang to recognize the um, accomplishments, and they enjoyed that. Our Kids Heart Challenge, which used to be Jump Rope for Heart, um, this year was our 14th year, and our students raised $13,510. And that is led by our amazing um, Danielle Peterson, who's our FIA teacher, and the children love her. And she um, has such an influence on them. This year, they had to choose to do daily 60 minutes of exercise or drink more water or perform a good deed. And I'm not kidding you, as I walked around the elementary school, the children were able to tell me what they were working on that day. So um, she just has such a positive, wonderful influence on our kids. 
Our track and field day we are going to host on Tuesday, June 1st. It will be um, outdoors and we will be running that by grade level. We won't have the entire elementary school out there at a time, but we will be going um, by grade level and we will still have it. Um, and last but not least, this is the first year that the elementary school has um, done the, access, uh, the forward test. And we started that last year, or last week, and we'll be done this week. And one more test, the access test, um, is organized by um, Mr. Hawkinson, our Spanish teacher. And he has completed that test with pride and energy and encouragement for our kids. And that has, the test has been submitted and mailed in. And those results we won't get until after school is out. So any questions? Is the access test for everyone? The, I'm sorry, the access test is for our EL students. So approximately 21 students, K-12. Thank you. Just a few updates here. I think most of what I'll talk about really briefly tonight, you've, you've heard in bits and pieces from others um, or, or last month, but um, I'd just like to add on to the Fast Bridge training model. Uh, one thing I think is very um, important to acknowledge around that is um, the skill and the will of our in-district staff to be able to develop those trainings in each of their buildings so that they're relevant to the developmental levels um, of those staff that are gonna be trained on using that new software. Um, it speaks a lot to the quality of our staff. It speaks a lot to people that are willing to um, buy in to a, a new uh, system um, to really uh, 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 teach it and uh, to uh, communicate it to their colleagues and that puts people on the spot that's not an easy thing to do and frankly it's it's something that a lot of people don't want to do you know as part of their daily work so I just really want to acknowledge all those in district trainers uh, Jess Smith Amanda Rowling Paula Johnson and Carrie Shu for really um, shouldering that work um, a lot of districts might contract out have somebody come in in a day um, it certainly isn't the sort of quality that we're, we're that I expect that we're going to get out of our people um, delivering that training in house. Uh, so a couple updates on uh, grants and mental health that was mentioned a couple times. Um, we will be, as you know, we've got a school-based mental health grant that's now uh, three years old, and there's another two-year cycle. That grant application process is is uh, um, right now. The new application uh, will be um, completed by Katie Johnson and Kate Weisenbeck. That's something that they're working on right now. Um, that money is um, between $10,000 and $75,000, depending on the activities um, that, that you're writing about and the size of the district, of course. Uh, and then another important grant that I spoke about last month was a Vibrant Communities Mental Health Grant. That one um, is from the St. Croix Valley Foundation. Um, the Pupil Services Department, under the leadership of Lisa Benson, we were able to complete that application. And uh, we just recently, just today, this morning, got an email from the St. Croix Valley Foundation. So I'll read it briefly here. Um, the foundation has awarded the Amory School District Pupil Services Department $2,500 to provide ongoing training for school staff and community members in the area of equity. Um, this training will help us to further understand how we can bring vulnerable populations um, close to the opportunities that help them achieve success. So um, more details to follow on that, what that professional development will look like, but next step is to get it on the in-service calendar and uh, beginning to pl plan that training, but um, certainly um, as we all know, the, the resources you know, are very helpful to be able to bring in a speaker, um, have a media event, and make something as engaging as possible so that we can build that bridge with the community uh, because that's an important aspect of um, all the work that we're doing with staff, with students around mental health in, in the school district of Amory. And I think that's all I have for tonight. Any questions? <coughs> All right, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.
Thanks, Mrs. Bunsen, for writing that grant and getting us some dollars in the school for more training and more mental health for our students and our staff. Thank you very much. Uh, the next item would be the 2021 AGR performance reports. Okay, this is um, the achievement gap reduction and annually the um, DPI requires schools to create performance objectives and to report to the school board twice a year. So you will see me now and you will see me at the end of the school year. Basically, what we use for reporting at the elementary school is FastBridge. You've heard that tonight from Mr. Benson and from Mr. Baumgartner. FastBridge is a benchmark assessment system. The elementary school this year, K through, two, K through three, actually, with Montessori, um, is implementing FastBridge, and the rest of the district is going to be implementing it next year. FastBridge is a monster, but it's a beautiful monster. There is so much that we can learn from FastBridge. It's an assessment system. It is an intervention system. So it takes the data from the assessment and it provides interventions that our teachers can put into place right away. Not only does it provide the intervention, it gives us the intervention. And it's scaffold. It depends on the needs of the child. So. It is a beautiful um, tool that we're using, and as Mr. Benson, who's always fiscally responsible, said, it saved us money because we did not, we got rid of our star, um, and, um, Thank and it you, did. Thank you, Mr. Benson. It, it, it saved us a lot of money, so. We like that about Mr. Benson. He <laughs> likes <laughs> that, yes. We like that. <clears throat> Yeah, so um, it's a great assessment system, but we are just at the tip of the iceberg learning about it. Um, Mr. Baumgartner talked about the leaders in each of the um, buildings that are leading our teams, and it's true. They are going to be meeting and making sure that the certification takes place because not only is it an assessment system, but the, the people need to be trained and certified um, to give the assessment, which is, which is really beautiful as well. So anyway, what you will see tonight is information, and it's really tiny and teeny, and I'll, I'm going to just highlight pieces of it, but you're going to, all of this is based on FastBridge from K through 2, and Orly is going to talk about third grade. So basically, um, we have to report out by grade level, and we have to report out in reading and math, and the performance letter uh, level that we have stated is above the 30th percentile and above. Um, the performance objective, we have to state, it's one of those little boxes up there, 80% of our students need, we're shooting to be at or above the 30th percentile. So what I'm going to have your eyes look at is the gray box. The gray box is going to show you what our data is. So our fall benchmark, and I don't want you to worry about this because we have really good growth happening in our schools right now, but if you remember last fall when we took it, that was about our, our children had missed a lot of school, right? We were, we, they weren't in school from March through um, when we started school in August or September, and we took the test right away this fall. So little instruction had occurred. So in kindergarten, 61% of our children had, are above the 30th percentile in reading. In math, 79% of our kids were above the 30th percentile. In first grade, reading, 40% of our kids were above the 30th percentile. In math, 69% of our kids were above the 30th percentile. In second grade, 69% of our children were above the 30th percentile, and in math, 70% of our kids were above the, the um, 30th percentile. And there's a common thread going through all of that. Our math scores print, presented themselves higher than our reading scores. So um, one of the things that we have worked on already with, um, with the guidance of our school personnel and with um, Teresa Stanley is the elementary school has adopted the Hegarty program, which is a program 
um, that was highly recommended for the foundational skills in the new essential um, standards. So we, we feel like we are already making headway and I'm hoping that when I report the scores to you again in um, hopefully June or July, you'll see that we've made some nice gains in reading. So any questions? Then orally we'll present the AGR for third grade. Thank you, Cheryl. She really did a great job explaining all of what we are doing with AGR, so I'm not going to continue that. Third grade, we have our fall bench bar mark was 62%. The other thing that I'll point out to you is we're still using the STAR this year, but next year we'll go to FastBridge, and the STAR is based on the 25th percentile, so that's just a little bit of a difference. Uh, but we're still looking for that 80% at t the 25th percentile or above. And so that was 62% of our kids last fall in reading. And in math, it was 78%. And as you know, we've really, over the last five or six years, really been trying to um, work hard on those math skills. And um, it's definitely showing up. And so um, really happy to see that. I would also just echo what Cheryl said. We've seen great growth already w with our winter benchmark uh, with these numbers. So it will be fun to see what the end of the year looks like. Any questions? Thank you. Thank you. All right, now we are um, on the action items. We already covered the first one. So the um, next action item on the agenda would be the second reading of the certified staff uh, compensation and benefits guide. The next two items go hand in hand. It's the certified staff and then the support staff. This is again the second reading. You saw this information last month and you're seeing here again. There's one tweak that we did in the certified staff um, document that you'll see and we'll highlight when we get there. So. To follow along, you'll see the compensation document, the yellow portion, and then you see red font. That's the proposal to move ahead in the first year, as in next school year, on certified staff salary. This is an item that you uh, heard about last month, and then Dale and Char in the listening sessions almost two months ago now, right here in this room, we had talked about at that time. The other yellow that you see is not a proposal. That is the change in PDH from 90, or 30, 60, 90 scale to 20, 40, 60. The only proposal on this page that you would be acting on is the salary increase that you see there highlighted in yellow. The next page has the, a lot of verbiage has been stricken. And what, what Becky and I sought to do is organize it and make it a little more presentable. So what we did in making it more presentable is to break it down by area, if you will. So the original version of this, everything was sort of lumped together and we weren't interested in doing that. So we made a category in essence of the extra degrees and certification. And then there was extra credits that you would be taking towards specific license. Those are not the same thing. So we made them look different. The item that I wanna highlight, we did not have settled for you special education license, maximum of two licenses, $2,000 total. This was not on the document last time. It is on the document now. Here is why. We have dis teachers in the district that have six, seven, eight special ed licenses. And that would sort of cost us out of the market of making a change if that person was due a six, seven, $8,000 pay increase. You may be wondering how that occurs. Once you have a special ed license, if you take one or two classes in a specific area, you accrue another license and many people do that because it makes them more marketable and makes them more uh, flexible in regards to as an employee in their present uh, district of work so that's the second area of suggestions and becky if you could move down i believe we got a couple of pages out and then there's a few other items the next item is actually i think there's only one more item and that is the leave personal day language the language that would be taken out of the document is the employee taking personal leave time will pay $100 per day to cover the assignment of the absent instructor. We wanna treat our employees in a professional manner. 
They have sick days at their disposal. We want them to use them if they need to use them. But we don't want folks to have to use personal days to do things such as attend a friend's wedding in Milwaukee that they can't get to by leaving at three o'clock that day. So we want to give them the opportunity to have those personal days to use <coughs> for personal reasons and save their sick days if they don't need to use them. And most staff understand there's value in sick days and that's a retirement piece. So that's the last change in the certified staff document. The next order of business for us as a compensation committee is to retool our membership, first of all, because we've lost some people to retirement and leaving district. And the next item after that is to look at PDH and to see how people are traveling through the scale. We want to examine that because we've only had it for about three or so years. So we want to take a look at that. So this is an action item and I'll certainly take questions if you have them. Basically, on your certified staff schedule, you, this uh, increase will be a little over eighty-one thousand. Then, correct. For our, correct. For and as we discussed last time, Andy and I have met multiple times in regards to the budget on this, and we are confident that we can shoulder that cost. You're not going to pay your employees the same wage year after year. It's just not. It's the cost of doing business in any line of work. Only the first year is what you're approving here tonight. You're not approving year two and year three, but I want you to know that's on the horizon. That's the goal, to make us competitive at the beginning, the middle, and the end of the salary scale. Because in order to recruit teachers and have them stay, you have to. You absolutely have to. Yeah, I think um, we, uh, Dale and I sat with the uh, committee and all about the reasons that we heard for uh, making these changes were very valid. I think we talked about them a little bit last board meeting and we ran the numbers and it seemed to be a sustainable cost to the district. Um, I think it it's behooves us to uh, show the appreciation of the work that our staff does to retain the staff that we have is important. Um, and it, it puts us in a position that uh, that we get good staff members. So. I think it makes good sense to do that. So if you're interested in doing that, that'd be a need to be in action by okay. all of you. Is there any other yeah. discussion or is there a motion to um, accept the uh, second reading or <coughs> certified staff compensation and benefits? I'll make a motion that we approve the uh, second reading of the certified staff compensation and benefits guide. I'd second that. Okay. All in favor say aye. 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 Anyone opposed? All right, it's approved. Uh, the next would be the uh, support staff. Okay, this is a revisit of what you saw last month. On that first page, you'll notice that there are two items that are changed. The training uh, per hour wage is the same now as extra driving. It's really for Twyla's sanity as much as anything, such as <laughs> this is one wage. Uh, the meal reimbursement, we've moved that from $6 to $12, I'm sort of a little surprised by that amount and that it's been there since the early 2000s. <laughs> and I'm not so sure where you're gonna get a meal for $6, unless you're a light eater, I guess. Um, the, the shift slash pay differential, we've changed some of the language there. Nothing's changed since you saw it last. Um, basically, if someone is changing duties the language reflects that if they're changing duties almost involuntarily because it's a need, uh, we're going to be honoring wages as you move about. It's simply the respectful thing to do with staff. The next change is noted uh, retirement or separation of employment. Nothing's changed in regards to that since you saw it last meeting. We're striking the maximum of 100 days. What we talked about here in this room, if you've been an employee that has banked your days and you've got 127 days, you ought to get paid for 127 days if you've been a faithful employee and you've been here every day because that's how you're getting 127 days is by being here every day. So yep. we took that clause out. A little further down, and it's really the last change in the document is the leaves and vacations. 
We talked here, Dale, Shar, myself, and the support staff members. The scale, as presently written, goes one year, two years, 12 years, 20 years. From two to 12, that's a long haul to not get any additional vacation days. So what we, what we did is add some levels. Now we're at one, two, five, 10, 12, 15, and 20. So there's some bumps there along the way. And this is uh, noted here, it's paid through payroll. So those are the support staff items that we talked about in listening session in March and here again tonight. Yeah, I think uh, those were good common sense changes that we uh, talked about for our support staff. And I think all of our bus drivers and, and uh, people that need re meal reimbursement, they deserve a, a good meal and Twyla deserves some sanity. So with that, I would move that we accept the uh, support staff compensation benefits proposed changes as written. I'll second that. Okay. All in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? All right. And yeah. I would like to say real quick, a huge debt of gratitude to the certified staff committee and the support staff committee. We've met, well, heck, has to be a dozen times by now, and they have been fantastic to work with. They're incredibly bright people that live this every day, and they're giving suggestions that I wouldn't even begin to think about because I'm not, I'm not doing it like they're doing it. And it's been a really valuable process. And I especially want to thank Jess Smith. She's a member of both committees. And Cheryl Meyer, she's a member of both committees. And they see it, obviously, from another perspective. And they're helping us negotiate out, figure this out, and moving along. And our work's not done, but we're making some progress. So I want to thank that, those committees and, and Jessica and Cheryl. So, yeah, I've had the you. opportunity and the pleasure to serve on that committee for two years. Uh, COVID kind of took away a different year for us, but um, I think Dale served on that committee for long it's before been a while. I was. Yeah, so mm -hmm. and, it's been Jess a while. and I go way back. So <laughs> many, many meetings. Yeah. And I would what say you saying, that uh, you know these are hard conversations to have. I mean, it's always going to cost the district money. There's always you know people are always swinging for the fences, and I don't blame them. And uh, it's always been done in a respectful manner, and um, whatever the decisions that ends up to be shaking out from the mm -hmm. board. Um, I know that the employees um, have been have met with open arms and we haven't lost anybody yet so it seems to seems to work out really good so I thank everybody for being respectful in that regard to have some tough conversations yeah. okay okay well there was a motion and a second and everybody was in favor so the support staff compensation and benefits um, uh, guide is approved did we vote we did All right, the uh, next would be the Lean Elementary HVAC project. Bad news to report, the HVAC at the elementary did not fix itself. <laughs> we were hopeful. Cheryl didn't really? fix it. George didn't fix it. It ain't fixed. So we still have a HVAC problem. Our policy indicates we need to seek three bids. We went above and beyond and we saw it six bids. We secured two bids. Unfortunately, the price tag is bigger than we thought it was going to be. It's sort of equivalent to sticking the round peg in the, in, in the square hole because this was built and then the building was built around it. And the building was built in 1967. So it is quite a deal. You've seen the pictures. You know that it's a problem in light of what you saw in person in further last meeting. The bids that we saw are listed there. Sorry, I stand correctly. We had five bids and we ended up with two. And the two that we received are Paul's Sheet Metal and Harris in company. Is there anything that you wanted to add, George, or any questions you might have for George? He's still willing to give tours for those who want to see it. It's very exciting. It is pretty exciting, actually. Yeah, I, I did everything I could to, to get three bids and I've never bids. seen so much of George in my life. He was in my office every day with the latest on these bids. So we need an action in order to approve one of the bids. The bids you see are different in value or in price for the exact same work. And uh, one is $200,000 less than the other. So it's up to you how you want to proceed. And so George, you'd be comfortable with either one of these two 
Yeah, in companies. fact, uh, the last company did our last uh, big HVAC project at the high school, so. Harris Company. Uh, so we have experience working with Harris? Yep. Good experience? Yeah, and 207,000 cheaper <coughs> to be exact. Yes. Yeah. It's that fiscal yeah. responsibility again yes. right now. Yes. I, I totally figured they missed something, so I, I went over it with a fine tooth, tooth comb to make sure they were apples to apples, and, and they were. So we need an action to... I make a motion that we go with Harris Company for the HVAC uh, project at the elementary school. I'll second that. Okay. All in favor say aye. 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 Anyone opposed? All right. Uh, the Harris Company uh, bid will be accepted. Thank, thank you very much. And Hello. thank you to George for all of his work on this. This has been a journey and then some. And thank you to the elementary staff for their patience, including Cheryl Meyer, because it feels like there's a bunch of hamsters in her ceiling. <laughs> that are loose. <laughs> the next action item would be the uh, resolution authorizing the sale of property. We are, believe it or not, on house number three and we are moving fast towards completion of house number three. If you've driven past it, as I do every morning, you see the latest that's occurred there. I met with Josh last week, Josh Ganji that is, and we are on schedule to complete this house within this school year and you'll need to give me the authorization to put name on dotted line to sell the house, because we'll be ready to do that. We ha already have likely a prospective buyer in line that's been communicating with us for the better part of the school year. So we might be able to get her done faster than we ordinarily would. So I'll need your permission to be able to sign, so to speak. I'll make the motion to approve the sale of Construction Academy House. I second that. We are doing bids on number four right now, actually, so we're no, no rest for the weary. <laughs> all right, all in favor say aye. 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 Anyone opposed? All right, the resolution authorizing the sale of property is approved, and I believe Dale has to sign it. Yes, I believe Dale's okay. the clerk is who signs right. it. And then uh, next would be to accept donations to the, the district. Okay, we have one donation to the district for the playground. Uh, it is Cassie Anderson has donated $400 for playground equipment at Lean Elementary in member of her in memory of her daughter Kyla. Is that all you say that Cheryl? Is that accurate, Kyla? And um, you would need to take action to accept that. Well, Kyla was one of my Girl Scout girls, and um, so I think that'll be wonderful to have this. Um, this new playground and um, and it will be wonderful to have that donation in her memory towards that project. So I'll make a motion that we accept that uh, donation with many thanks to Cassie and our hearts remembering Kyla. I second that. All in favor say aye. 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 Anyone opposed? All right, the uh, donation is accepted and approved. Um, the next item would be the 2021 spring board, uh, spring, spring school board um, <laughs> election results and the oath of office. Okay, you'll see here the, the official school board election results. We canvassed it late last week. We had two open positions and two candidates, Shar Glenna receiving 1,021 votes and Keith Anderson receiving an even 1,000 votes and there weren't any other candidates. There were a few write-ins and scattering, but at the end of the day, that has <coughs> Shar and Keith ready to take their oath of office for another three years of fun. You want it, you can go first. <laughs> <laughs> I, Charlotte Glenna, who have been duly elected to the Board of Education of the School District of Amory, swear that I will support the Constitution of the United States and the Constitution of the State of Wisconsin and will faithfully and impartially discharge the duties of the said office to the best of my ability, so help me God. I, Keith Anderson, who have been duly elected to the Board of Education of the School District of Amory, swear that I will support the Constitution of the United States and the Constitution of the State of Wisconsin and will faithfully and impartially discharge the duties of said office to the best of my ability. So help me God. You sign and then Twyla will notarize and then it will be official. Okay, 
Okay, thanks yeah. to everybody who uh, got out to vote. vote. Um, whether you voted for for us, didn't vote for us, um, just that you got out to vote and exercised your your voice and your right to do so means a lot to me. Um, I especially, obviously, appreciate the people who did vote for us. I think we've done a lot of really good work here. Um, I know I felt very privileged and honored to serve for the last three years, and um, I really do look forward to serving for the next three years. And when I say serving, I really do mean to serve. Yeah. Touche. Right. Ditto that, right? Yeah. <laughs> Congratulations. Yeah. All right, the last item would be personnel. Okay, we have new employment contracts for, for Carissa Bondas, for high school math, Brooke Killeen, is that all you say it orally? Do you know right offhand? Okay, I got it right. All right, for AIM advisor, Rose Kupker, she is a district school nurse, Kylie Olson, first grade teacher, Jason Sargent, math teacher at the high school, Cody Williquit, custodian, daytime, or nighttime actually, Lean Elementary. We have extra uh, curricular contracts for Ryan Humpel for varsity football, Tyler Peterson, JV boys golf coach. Reassignments, Jessica D'Ambrosio from first grade to intermediate school principal, Justin Shu from intermediate and middle FIED to high school FIED. And then resignations for Levi Bussey in middle school football, Mark Luman, varsity basketball coach. And three times over to make it really clear from <laughs> Brian Melberg for high school social studies, Brian Melberg for varsity boys golf coach, and Brian Melberg for AV coordinator. Not to belittle the rest of these uh, uh, personnel items, but in that Brian is sitting here, uh, we congratulate him and wish him well wearing blue over in Clear Lake as the new middle and high school principal. Don't forget about your, your red upbringing here in Amory. <laughs> If we if we choose to accept all of those all except but Brian? for yeah. Brian, well, I don't know. Do we have to let him go then? I mean, how does that work? This would be his first administrative decision. What would he do in response? <laughs> Did he bring treats? <laughs> no. Oh well, then you're out. <laughs> he has one more board meeting. Once. Yeah. <laughs> all right. I make a motion that we accept the personnel action. Okay. Is there a second? I'll second. All right, all in favor say aye. 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 All right, the personnel action is approved. Yeah, we need to move in closed. And there is no reason, oh, you we wanna do. go into closed? Yeah, okay. we do. All right, I guess we will, um, I will make a motion, or take a motion to go into closed session to consider employment, promotion, compensation, or performance evaluation data of any public employee for, over which the governmental body has jurisdiction or exercises responsibility in order to take personnel action pursuant to Wisconsin statute 19.851C and deliberating or negotiating the purchasing of public properties, the investing of public funds or conducting other specified public business whenever competitive or bargaining reasons require a closed session pursuant to Wisconsin statute 19.851E. So oh. moved. Second. Second. All in favor say aye. 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 Roll call, Aaron? Yes. Star? Yes. Dale? Yes. Keith? Yep. All right. Yes. We're